completely forgotten no one knows an insignificant town out of the dark has made a mark Both bells should be returned. In that, um, it was stolen from 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 Balangiga, uh, and I think the idea of that being considered as war trophies is just perverse. The bells were used to signal the attack in 1901. At that time, those bells we feel became instruments of war, and any entitlement to the bells as religious objects or any other uh, property other than as an instrument of war was relinquished. I think a bell is an inappropriate trophy of war. It'd be like using a chalice or a menorah for a trophy. And so for that reason, I'm, I just think it's, 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 uh, it's somewhat uh, uh, affronting to me to see a bell as a trophy of war. What makes me angry is when I hear our government wish to dismantle a monument like this and offer to give it back to a country that we've not had especially good relations with, people who don't necessarily like us, perhaps never will. The tragedy is that we have a new belfry for bells, for the bells, but there are no bells. When I went to Xi'an, Wyoming, there were two bells, but there is no belfry. I mean, that's a tragedy. No, <laughs> why don't we, we, we merge them together, bring them together, and, and serve the purpose for which they were. The Bells of Balangia are the remains of a bloody war between the Philippines and the United States, an unknown chapter of the Spanish-American War. Two different worlds are in conflict about their past and how it impacts the present. I never believed that objectivity was possible and I never believed it was desirable. In a world like this, to be neutral is to collaborate with whatever is going on. Whatever is selected for you is uh, dependent on the viewpoint of the selector. You know, I, I wanted to go into the past and, and come out and, and see what I could find out from the past that would be useful in what is happening in the world today. History is important. If you don't know history, it's as if you were born yesterday. And if you were born yesterday, anybody up there in a position of power can tell you anything, and you have no way of checking up on it. The bells of Balangika. These bells came from a church in Balangika, Samar, located in the Philippine Islands. The ringing of these bells signaled the attack by Bolo tribes. Jean Wall Sunday reads this dedication to the men who lost their lives a century ago on an island halfway round the world. Her father, Adolf Gamlin, was wounded but survived. On the Philippine island of Samar, the village of Balangia honors its greatest hero, Valeriano Abanador. It was he who struck the first blow against the Americans. His granddaughter, Oria Amano, remembers. I know, Valdenor. Yes, it was from him I first heard about the encounter. Sometimes I would listen to him and I would tell myself how brave the people of Balangia were in their heroic struggle. Another Philippine hero of this attack was Major Eugenio Daza. Roy Daza keeps the legacy of his grandfather's exploits and bravery alive. Major Daza was the political and military mastermind who organized the attack on Company C. A century later, the descendants on both sides of the conflict have relentlessly attempted to justify their cause. Here it is. Here, now this is a very interesting one. And this is my father right here. This guy right there. And this was the company mascot. 
This is a letter from Bill Newhoff. And do you remember Bill? Yes. I am stunned to think that the Philippine people and the Catholic Church would even consider having the bells return that signaled the natives to attack Company C. This is absolutely disgraceful. These people have very short memories. Do we owe the people of Samar the bells? No way. They owe Company C big time. Keep the bells in the USA. Balangia is a peaceful fishing village. Local villagers remember its violent past, yet the present remains seemingly the same. In Chicago, a Philippine-American theater group rehearses their play. It's a musical called The Bells of Balangia. <laughs> Can you sing the part before, before uh, Balangia? We are your name is imprinted beneath the proud flags of America. Balangia, your name is imprinted Music by Louis Picasso. the proud flags of America. Words by Rodi Vera who is flying from Manila to Balangia for the annual reenactment. I want to rewrite it uh, primarily, I think, it's also because I want to make it a little bit more historically accurate. I had no time to, to interview the descendants. All I got at that time were documents. If we could go to Balangiga again and, in fact, talk to the descendants. And this is going definitely to influence the way I want to rewrite it. Nga pagko ana nagaabusar na mga Amerikano din ng mga sundal. They raped the women. Also, Americans confiscated food from the farmers and fish hook and net from the fishermen. Even those who were on the sidewalks, especially those talking in groups, were caught and put in prison, especially the men. Ni wala man naglarang nerahen pa ik away ng mga Amerikano. According to my aunt, the rice lands were burned, the fruit trees were cut, camote plantations were uprooted. That was a strategy so the natives would cooperate and obey. Because of their rage, they also burned the natives' farms and destroyed their crops. The natives then refused to cooperate with the soldiers. Because of the many abuses, the natives rose to fight against the soldiers. Significant town out of the dark has made a mark. 
Midday in Balangia, a blistering sun shines down on the thousands of people who gather here from all over the island of Samar to witness the annual reenactment of one of the most violent encounters of the Philippine-American War. Behind Balangia's church, the drama is carried out as authentically as possible. Folk tale and documentation each play their roles. Men dressed as women carry the caskets into the church pretending that they contain dead infants. The coffins actually contained bolos and knives. This strategy for the attack on Company C was planned by Major Daza and Valeriano Abanador. of us when we arrived. There were 33 when we went back home. We had to come back and beat them at their own game. population went down from 300,000 to 250,000. Roughly 50,000 were killed in a burning spree. And all that we can remember was the bells, the terrible bells, the dreadful, the frightening bells that rang. So is it noble or is it treachery? The events leading to the Philippine-American War had its start with the Spanish-American War of 1898. It is a hundred years since America helped to liberate Cuba from Spain, annexed Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Guam, and the Philippine Islands. The United States became an empire, and here in the present, we celebrate what we remember, or care to remember. The joys of those victories, the charisma of those heroes, the emergence of an American dynasty that recognizes no borders. The Spanish-American War signaled the start of what was to be deemed to be the American century, and with it, an appeal for patriotic commitment from the populace. What do you see? Patriotism is as much a duty in time of peace as it is in time of a righteous war. Nations are not made, defended, and preserved by the illusions. No, not at all. But rather by the men and women who practice the homely virtues in time of peace and in time of a righteous war, are ready to send those they love best or to sacrifice themselves for a shining ideal. We'll just keep going on, touching each boundary Line, like a little baby Climbing his mother's knee America, I love you And there's a hundred million numbers like me uh, Well, that bravado fitted uh, the American need uh, to do something glamorous in the world. Remember, it had been 35 years since the end of the Civil War. Uh, the memory had faded. Theodore Roosevelt was the vice presidential candidate on the McKinley ticket, 
and uh, he was a kind of war hero. He'd gone up Kettle Hill next to San Juan Hill. Uh, you know, he could barely see without his eyeglasses. All I know that Teddy Roosevelt was a very brave soldier to go up San Juan Hill and uh, lead the volunteers to victory. He was a terrific man. I, in fact, I think I used to be his water boy. I'm only 73 years old, that's all. <laughs> Personally, he's my favorite president. I mean, he put us on the world stage. He was uh, a guy that uh, did the right thing. And uh, I don't know if we'll see that again in our lifetime. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt appears on all of the uh, all of the lists. You know, every once in a while they drop lists of the, our greatest presidents. We're, we're great for lists, and Theodore Roosevelt is always on those lists, high up on the list. One of our great. Well, in fact, right? We just have four presidents on Mount Rushmore. Theodore Roosevelt is one of them. Maybe you know that. It has worried me a lot. Just learning a little about Theodore Roosevelt, I, after, I said to myself, "What is he?" doing up there on Mount Rushmore, and how can we get him off? <laughs> so, uh, Theodore Roosevelt wrote to a, a friend of his just before the Spanish-American War, in strict confidence, he didn't know we would be reading this letter later, <laughs> he said, in strict confidence, I should welcome any war, for I think this country needs one. Well, it's understandable. Every once in a while, you need a war. Roosevelt always needed a war. Um, he told the Navy War College, all the great masterful races have been fighting races. No triumph of peace is quite so great as the supreme triumph of war. In 1893, on the 30th anniversary uh, of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Confederates and the Union veterans had joined together for the first time. And so we were all ready. Uh, and Roosevelt had already said in uh, 1895, what this country needs is a war. Another multiple choice thing. What is the name of the battleship that was sunk in Havana Harbor that led to the Spanish-American War? The Spaniards must have done it. Whenever something like that happens and we don't know who did it, we can guess who did it. So we fight in Cuba. American cabinet member John Hay says, a splendid little war. A three-month war, very few American casualties. We win. It's, you know, it's a triumphal event. Right after that, we take Hawaii, because once you have Cuba, you need Hawaii. <laughs> Don't try to figure that one out. <laughs> Certainly once you have Hawaii, you need the Philippines. Uh, and uh, the Philippines also belong to Spain. We just defeated Spain. We deserve the Philippines. President McKinley says God told him to take the Philippines. When next I realized that the Philippines had dropped into our lap, I confess I didn't know what to do with them. That there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and educate them and uplift and civilize and Christianize them. And by God's grace, we do the very best we can by them. Since they are our fellow men for whom Christ also died. The Filipinos are heathens. <laughs> they aren't listening to the same God. They fight back. The splendid little war was over, and a real war took its place. A war against the Filipino people who refused to be annexed. They had fought Spanish tyranny long before Admiral Dewey sailed into Manila Bay. In February of 1899, they rose in a revolt against American occupation. Emilio Aguinaldo, their elected president, now became their commander in chief. He had proposed Filipino independence within a United States protectorate, but this was rejected by President McKinley. It took the United States years to crush their army, using more than 70,000 troops, four times as many as landed on Cuba. There were thousands of American casualties. 
an estimated half a million Filipinos were massacred. Countless villages and towns burned to the ground. It was America's first Vietnam. But it was on the island of Samar that some of the worst atrocities occurred. With the ringing of the church bells, the people of Balangia rose into action. In the bloody aftermath, retribution by the Americans was swift in coming. The American soldiers were ordered to burn the entire island and kill all the inhabitants over the age of 10. The official reason for going to the Philippines uh, was that uh, these people were incapable of ruling themselves and that to leave them there, possibly to be prey to the uh, naval forces and military forces of some of the other imperial nations, would be cowardly. That was the word that was often used. The, the, there was a lot of controversy about the United States going into the Philippines and taking the Philippines and fighting that war, especially as the news came back about the atrocities we were committing in the Philippines. And there were Americans, as there always have been Americans, who have protested against what the you know, United States was doing abroad. In New England, an, an anti-imperialist league was formed. Among its members were some of the leading writers and intellectuals of the era. Edgar Lee Masters, William Lloyd Garrison, Carl Schurz, William Dean Howells, William James, and the industrialist Andrew Carnegie. The vice president of the league was the humorist and essayist Mark Twain. In one of his many anti-war essays, he quotes letters from American soldiers stationed in the Philippines. From the letter of an American soldier lad in the Philippines to his mother, describing the finish of a victorious battle, we never left one alive. One was wounded, we would run our bayonets through him. Company I had taken a few prisoners and stopped. They had four prisoners and didn't know what to do with them. They asked Captain Bishop what to do, and he said, you know the orders. And four natives fell dead. Charles Bremer of Minneapolis. Talk about war being hell. This war beats the hottest estimate ever made of that locality. Kalukin was supposed to contain 17,000 inhabitants. The 20th Kansas swept through it, and now Kalukin contains not one living native. Captain Elliot, I never saw such execution in my life, and hope never to see such sights as met me on all sides as our little corps passed over the field, dressing wounded, legs and arms nearly demolished, total decapitation, horrible wounds in chests and abdomens, showing the determination of our soldiers to kill every native in sight. F.E. Blake of California. We have pacified some thousands of the islanders and buried them, destroyed their fields, burned their villages, turned their widows and orphans out of doors, furnished heartbreak by exile to some dozens of disagreeable patriots, subjugated the remaining 10 millions by benevolent assimilation, which is the pious new name of the musket. This is very hard for me to go. Oh, yes. But every time I walk up here, it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it's the same. That's our name. O C O. Yes, and L. L. L M. Have you got that? M R. M R. Her father was one of the few men that had rifles because they trusted the mayor and the chief of police of Valangiga. They trusted all of the Filipinos in that area. They thought they were there to to serve as peacekeepers and help these people. And uh, all of a sudden, things changed. And uh, the chief of police, talking to, to uh, Adolph Gamblin, suddenly grabbed his rifle, hit him in the head, uh, knocked him down, knocked him unconscious, 
signaled for the bells of Balangiga to ring, which was the signal for the massacre to occur. Totally different sound. And listen to the ring of the bell and touch them and feel them. Well, I guess it's almost a shrine to us. The previous year, Jean Wall journeyed to Balangia for the reenactment day. It is then she met Kole Amano and asked to buy Kole's grandmother's crucifix. She wanted to buy it, but I wouldn't sell it. These are my souvenirs from my grandmother, and I'm going to keep them. This was her death wish, so I will keep them. Cassiana Nacionales, the grandmother of Kole Amano, was the sole woman involved in the attack on the American garrison. She dashed into the fray carrying her bolo, her crucifix, and rosaries. Was she waving it like this? She was running around with the rosary beads. The Philippine ambassador, in a determined effort for the Bell's return, addresses businessmen, politicians, and war veterans at the Rotary Club in Cheyenne. Raul Chavez Rabe. Jim, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And I thought I should uh, go back to the beginning of our relationship at the turn of the century, this century. And I have brought along a video, uh, which we will be showing sort of to introduce what I have to say. It's called Savage Acts. It's not the complete story about the relationship, but maybe it will do well to introduce what I have to say. To the American people, why do you deny us liberty? Why are you fighting against the cause of independence, of progress, and of justice? Soon, we had orders to advance, and we started across the creek in mud and water up to our waists. We did not mind it a bit. Our fighting blood was up, and we all wanted to kill niggers. This shooting human beings is a hot game, and beats rabbit hunting all to pieces. We charged them, and you never saw such slaughter. We killed them like rabbits. Hundreds, yes, thousands of them. The film was very, very controversial, and um, if I had had my preference, I think I would have said, don't show it. All of us were raised thinking of the Spanish-American War as this time of great, noble, uh, freeing of oppressed peoples. No one ever told us when we were in high school or even in college uh, that the Philippines was not exactly a voluntary uh, participant. It made us sort of so us uh, talking about the United States forces in the Philippines, uh, soldiers of fortune, opportunists, uh, uh, professional killers, if you will, that were were there to, and, and it was it was just such a distortion of what the actual facts were that we heard, for example, uh, from uh, uh, Jean Wall, who described her father as a very quiet. Uh, uh, farm kid from Iowa. Remember what it was like for my father when he relived those experiences, very vivid in my mind, even as a very small child. And even the night before he passed away, he had one of the nightmares in the hospital. It was just the same nightmare that he always had. The goo -goos are coming, the goo -goos are coming and screaming out in the middle of the night. And if you weren't familiar with it, it was quite fr frightening.
I wanted to be out in the square. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be where my father was uh, when he was struck down. I wanted to see what the light of day was. I, I, I wanted to, uh, to try to feel what it could possibly be like, that sudden attack, that surprise. I don't think this was a sneak attack. And I don't think any Filipino would call that strategy a sneak attack. Maybe to the Americans, since they lost the battle. And this is the happy part of the Philippine-American War. I think Papa uh, came from a very poor farm family. And there were no jobs at that time. And for the rest of his life, my father thought that the military, I mean, it was just actually the best thing that ever happened to him in his life was those years of service. Like Gene Wall's father, thousands of young men left farms and villages across the nation to take part in this war. Some for the adventure, some for the steady paycheck, and some out of a sense of patriotic duty. Following the Civil War, Cheyenne, Wyoming had the largest cavalry post in the nation. It was from here that its men rode out to chastise and civilize the Sioux, Kiowas, and the Cheyennes. In 1901, they rode out once again, this time to fight a people 7,000 miles away who refused to be subdued. Nearly every American general who fought in the Philippines had engaged in the wars against the Indian nations. Generals Arthur MacArthur, Yule Otis, E. Franklin Bell, Leonard Wood, Adna Chafee, and the most notorious and brutal of all, General Jacob Smith. It was he who ordered all inhabitants on the island of Samar over the age of 10 to be killed. For an American, isn't it, I mean, to think of having to go in and kill a child? But this child is the enemy and he's bearing arms and he's going to kill you. And it just seems logical to me that they would have to give an order to go in and attack the enemy no matter what the age. It would make sense to me. The generals in the field were reporting that for every one Filipino wounded, 15 were killed. And this really gives you a sense of what the war was like. In, in comparison during the Civil War, for every soldier killed, five were wounded. So it's not just a reverse, but a reverse times three um, in the Philippines, where you know, obviously so the American soldiers were killing f wounded Filipinos. Well, if people knew what a thieving, treacherous, worthless bunch of scoundrels those Filipino are, they would think differently than they do now. You can't treat them the way you do civilized folks. I do not believe that there are half a dozen men in the United States Army that don't think Smith is all right. They killed the men, the women, the children. The policy of the American government was to wage the harshest, the sharpest, uh, and, and most decisive uh, campaign here in summer so that people will say, no more war. It was a very normal reaction of military units. It's happened thousands and thousands of times when a military unit is, is uh, surprised in an operation like that. They overreact, they go after them. And then taking no prisoners is not a new, <laughs> that wasn't invented in 1901. That has been going on. Uh, still goes on, as a matter of fact. Sa, sa, mga, sa mga American history na basihan natin, ano? In Luzon alone, six... In sa, Luzon uh, alone, Luzon. more than 600,000 Filipinos died more than in this Philippine-American war. Some were killed, others died later, but their death was traced to the war. And this was only in Luzon. In San Luzon, lang yan, more than 600,000 Filipinos died. Daisy, Daisy, 
give me your answer to. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. On July 4th, 1902, President Teddy Roosevelt officially and unilaterally declared the end to the Philippine-American War. In 1906, there are still rebellious Filipinos on a southern island, and these people have no weapons. They live in a very primitive way. The United States Army moves in with artillery and wipes out 600 of these moros, men, women, children. Every last one of them is killed. Roosevelt sent a telegram of congratulations to the general who commanded that operation. Theodore Roosevelt, I know you may think I'm picking on Roosevelt, but I felt that Roosevelt was picking on the world. Major, please read the citation. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt distinguished himself by acting And even the politicians who go there have somehow didn't, didn't see what, what's happening in the reenactment. I think the reenactment was, was good. But uh, the reason why it was it, it's I, I isolated thing is it's so, probably so taken out of context. It is seen as something that happened in the past without any direct connection of what is happening now. At present, I can tell you that like the heroes of Balangia, we are also in the midst of a warfare. A warfare that we are fighting not through guns, not with machine guns, not with machetes, not with grenades, not with cleavers. A warfare we are fighting in our workplaces, with tourism, with industry, with investment. We have a 50 billion peso budget deficit. It means that we have to borrow money again from other countries. a sign of benevolence from the country that cares for all. This is a sign of American democracy for the small. You who believe the Americans are savage and cruel men may have to think and think again. Americans can understand. I should impart to these my brothers what I have come to know. This I must have misunderstood. Have I instead done more harm than good? Should I The economic opportunities are, are, are not there to provide economic growth for a, for a greater number of people, which could have been thwarted had we were, we were given the opportunity to manage our own economy. Pintik has this vision of you know, um, creating a, 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 a community that is critical of its own issues. Pintik realizes the fact that theater is a good way to reach out to the community. And in particular, as artists, as cultural workers, 
as community organizers, use the arts as our medium for being able to help organize the community. I really think that we should own our histories and that, for example, for Filipinos, if, if we don't tell these stories and remember these histories as a, as a collective and public experience, then all those people who died, died for nothing. Now is this treachery, treachery? We ask you, how could a treachery, treachery? By putting in characters, both American and Filipino characters, like a dramatic debate, talking to each other and arguing to each other about the motivations behind the massacre. Your name is erased. There were 71 of them, clad in blue wool shirts and khaki trousers and wearing felt campaign hats. I think this is part of my history as being Filipino. I want my people here in the States both Americans and Filipinos, to know the real history of what happened in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War, during the Filipinos' fight for independence, and all the small cruelties and large cruelties that happened against our people with all the uh, colonial um, education that happened, which I was personally affected by growing up as well, where none of my history as a Filipino was ever taught to me. Uh, I think uh, it was the whole education system which the American controlled, no? So we had a very colonial education. We learned how to sing the American anthem. They learned so many things American. People don't see the implication it has had on the whole history of the colonizing of the Americans. I think the whole thing, uh, reenactment, could have been a wonderful opportunity for correcting our, hist our view of our own history. And it's all there, it's all so obvious. I think the true reconciliation does not just rest on making replicas of the bells and, and, or, or even releasing the bells and going back, although that would be the fitting symbol. Can, can I just take a look at it? Just, uh, just knows what Is it do. an I, ivory? Uh, no, it's, it's ivory. You think it's ivory? Or yeah. Yeah, it's ivory. I'm happy uh, to welcome uh, uh, Ambassador Ravi to my home. And I'm particularly uh, grateful this morning for this opportunity because I would like to give him a gift. The Bishop of Barogan in Eastern Samar wrote and asked me if I would help him get the bells for his church. I thought if I'm going to help him get the bells back for his church, maybe I should give the statue back as well. It's a very small Madonna, but it, has, it is rich with, with tradition, rich with religious uh, sentiments, and therefore we, we receive it very, very warmly. I was very, very thankful to Bishop Hart for that initiative, even without our even asking it, out of his own initiative, he gave that back to us. Maybe we ought to we ought to go, everybody ought to go overboard or a little bit, lean a little bit to that side anyway to return the statues in our own lives to whomever. This is only a gesture, of, um, a symbol. Maybe I have to do something, I have to do something and we all have to do something inside. Think about what can we do to help people and to help, really help them. I think I'm going to miss it uh, uh, in this, its place. It usually was out in the hallway on the table there, and uh, I think I'll miss it. I think it will be better taken care of and more highly thought of where it's going than it has been here.
I don't believe you've seen this, have you? No, I haven't. This, this is the is, first time. Well, look, isn't this something to think that they've done a play on the bells of Bell and Dika? A My nice first movie. initial reaction was and she should come a... see the play and hopefully have a dialogue with us. Um, because uh, we could, or I in particular, understand where she's coming from. This is something that is so close to her. In the same way that this issue is something so close to our hearts as well and to our souls and our beings. It's a pleasure to see oh, all well, of you. Yeah. What a wonderful job. Uh -huh. And it was such a fair representation for both sides. Okay. Yeah. I want yeah. you to know that. Yeah. Let me like shake all of your hands, <laughs> please, and tell you what a wonderful job. I just came back. Inday na kain ka, han kasunog han balang higa. Pito katulig nga naglaga, an aso aray kita. It says, Inday Inday. Inday Inday is a generic name for our young uh, female children. Uh, where were you when they burned balang higa? For seven years, it, it burned, but the smoke was never seen. She would tell us about the Americans, that they were big people. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Twain, I, I wish I had his statement in front of me, but Mark Twain had a very lovely statement to make about patriotism. Not long ago, I saw 15 or more boys training. They assumed a military air and went through the evolutions of trained soldiers. And this was to teach them patriotism. And this so-called patriotism, we mistake for citizenship. Now true citizenship is to protect the flag from dishonor. The patriotism is not supporting your government, it's supporting your country. It's uh, patriotism not consists of blindly following the flag, blindly pledging allegiance, blindly uh, accepting whatever your government does in the world, but patriotism consists of being a critical citizen of whatever is happening. There's this whole movement or this, this whole sentiment of saying, forget the past and work for reconciliation instead. Um, fine, I'm, I'm really for, for reconciliation, but um, I don't think I sh I'm, I'm for forgetting the past. In fact, I think um, the very same in, in, in institutions that have brought about this war are very much in place today. And um, I don't know whether our reconciliation could change all that. Merong accountant 
The first thing we are doing is launching a signature campaign to bring the bells back. Starting in eastern Samar, we are taking signatures of teachers, farmers, everyone. Also, we are presently bringing the campaign to Manila for the purpose of educating and knowing the sentiment, the awareness on this project. Sergeant U.S. Army, Spanish-American War, September 22nd, 1878, December 19th, 1969. Next time I come back, I want to come back when they put the medal on his grave. The medal the men should have had. In the 1960s, there is an investigation of the sinking of the Maine. You know, we very often do this thing. Somebody gets an idea 50 years later, hey, let's figure out how did the Maine get sunk? They go into all the, you know, they really investigate and they come to the conclusion an internal problem in the engine caused the explosion. Well, it was a little too late to stop us from getting into the Spanish-American War. Why has that been concealed from us? and then could go on to ask an even more important question. What else has been concealed from us? In other words, once you introduce the principle of skepticism, of challenging authority, of re-examining what has been told to you uh, in the schools and in the media, uh, and even by your parents, uh, once you introduce the idea of skepticism, uh, you have made an enormous contribution to education. This heritage of skepticism has become even more important today as relentless ticker tape one-liners and selective information have muffled the voice of dissent and diversity. takes care of that. The United States expanded after the American Revolution, expanded from a straggling bunch of colonies along the Atlantic coast to a huge continental power reaching the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico. And how did it get that way? By being nice. Well, the way we were brought up in school to believe the United States was good. The United States was the Boy Scout of the world. We would help countries across the Can't street. Help it. It, the facts add it up to that. A militaristic and expansionist and imperialist power. I hate to use bad words like Can't that. Can't help it. it. The facts I'm add up nice. to that. Florida Purchase by being nice. Mexican Session. Can't help it. it. The facts Louisiana add up to that. that. Everything was purchases and sessions. Well, those territories were all taken by force. We had 103 instances Boy of Scout of the world before 1895. Nice. Help it. Get That's excited. We've that. been doing this for a long time. 1850s, Marines landed in Argentina. Marines landed, landed in Nicaragua. 1850s also, the opening of Japan. Don't get excited. We've been doing At the end of three years of carnage, uh, where are we? The in North Korea, the Kedeship in South Korea, only it's several strange, years. strange yeah. when you think about it. Scout of we the world. cannot allow Vietnam no, to go rubber communist. and oil. Have you noticed tin, Vietnam has gone communist? Oil. Tin, and, uh, rubber and oil. The world hasn't come to a National end. Security Council memoranda talking about why the United States was interested tin, in rubber in and oil. Asia. And the three words that kept coming up again and again and again were tin, rubber, and oil. The new government in the Iran, which wanted to nationalize the oil fields, the United States Boy Scout of the world, overthrow the Iran. Overthrow, overthrow, overthrow. In Guatemala, they elected somebody who was sort of left of center. He wasn't a communist. He talked to communists. Don't ever talk to a communist. And we fight the war in the Gulf. A splendid little war, right? A splendid little war. Casualties. A splendid little war. A splendid, nice. a splendid. There is a guerrilla movement in Colombia. The United States want to suppress it because United States, in, in general, general, the United States does not like, like revolutions. We had our revolution. 
There's a quota for revolutions. One, you see. The United so, States was the Boy Scout of the world. We would help countries across the street.